Well, it's good to see each of you here this morning. Those of you who came to be with your moms, I know your moms appreciate it. Uh, I always enjoy being with my mom on Mother's Day. Uh, and uh, those of us whose moms have gone on, uh, we're somewhat envious of you that you still have your mom. So enjoy your mom while you can, because uh, uh, they may not be here uh, for the rest of your life, uh, sad to say. So. I want to uh, broach a new subject today, and it's, uh, I thought about uh, making a CD or a DVD for everyone that's here and charge you $100 a piece to get it, because it's going to be worth having, all right? This is going to be a treasure that will go with you. Uh, really, uh, I was telling someone the other day, uh, you, you never know where an idea for a sermon comes from or where t- the ideas come from. And, this one came from a, a song, an old Western song that said, can I have this dance for the rest of my life? And I thought about the rest of our lives. You know, what about the rest of our lives? And uh, the title of this series is, What Matters for the Rest of Your Life? What Really Matters? And let's look at Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, 10 and 11. And we're using the New Living Translation because it just says things in a way that I believe uh, you will appreciate. It says, for I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is indeed meat and drink unto us. And as we study this morning, we ask that your spirit might enlighten us, that our innermost being uh, would be fed, that we would learn the things that you would have us to learn about this treasure that each of us have, and that's the rest of our lives and what we'll be doing with it. Lord, uh, cause the things that you spoke to my heart, uh, that you once spoken in this place, uh, uh, to come to my remembrance, Lord. And if there's anything that uh, is not of you, just let it fall to the ground and become dust. Lord, and let uh, each of us hear what it is that the Spirit of God would say to us, the church of the living God, in this place, this day. And this we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. For those of you watching by the internet, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, And I think you will uh, identify with what I'm about to say. When I grow up, I want to be a, let's fill in the blank. When When you were a kid, what did you think about? When I grew up, I want to be a, the old, I think probably the most famous one was boys. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. Little girls, I want to be a princess. You know, and, uh, we all have these ideas of what we want to be. I want to own a house somewhere. I want to travel. I want to uh, be a public speaker. I want to, you know, all the things that we conjure up as children about what we want to be. I want to be just like my mom on Mother's Day, or I want to grow up like my dad. I want to, you know, do something significant. The majority of people live with the disappointment of what could have been. Some just throw in the towel and just live in depression. You know, I never, I wanted to be a success and I've just never been successful. And they live in depression with that. They can't get over that disappointment in their lives. Some people live with uh, abandon, trying to chase a childhood dream that they're never going to achieve. There's a guy I know who uh, wants to be a professional football player. And he's, uh, he's too old to be a professional football player now, but it's still... It drives him. It's, it's what makes him wake up in the morning and go to bed at night chasing a dream that's just not going to happen. Some people make it. 
Some people actually achieve their childhood dreams. I want to be a... And they make it. They reach the pinnacle of their life. And when they get there, they found out it was just a dream. That the reality of what they wanted isn't what they wanted at all. Many people have experienced that. Most of us just live out our lives day to day, kind of drifting through life, coming to the place where we just say, well, I'm never really going to achieve that childhood dream. I'm never going to achieve my goals in life. I'm just never going to be anybody. I heard a uh, preacher this morning say something that uh, I didn't like the way he said it, but he said, do you know that one day out of the billions and billions and billions of people on this earth, none of them will know you ever live. And I thought, how depressing is that? <laughs> you know? See, I'm going to make sure somebody knows I live. I'm going to go stencil it on a rock someplace where everybody has to go. Just to know, I said, you know, well, Kilroy was here. It was that old thing that they had during World War II, I believe, kind of came around. <clears throat> Paul addresses this issue by saying, that phrase that I use as a term in the sermon title is I want you to understand what really matters. And that's where we need to go, beloved. We need to go to the place of what really matters in our lives. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, most of this uh, congregation is uh, we're not kids any longer. We've, uh, I enjoy seeing babies here. I like seeing that little baby back there. I'm holding that. And that always encourages me that there's a, there's a new crop coming up, all right? But uh, what really matters? Does your, does your misdream really matter? I've talked to some of you, and I've talked to others uh, throughout my time of uh, ministry, and, uh, and people talk about how their life is controlled by the fact that they never made it. They had, a, they had a dream fantasized in their mind and their heart about who, were they, who they were going to be and what life was going to be like. They were going to marry Mr. Wright or Miss Wright, and they did, and it turned out to be a calamity, and they ended up divorced, you know? And living with that... Uh, situation. But does it really matter? Does it really matter for the rest of your life? Uh, do mistakes really matter? Some of you made some mistakes. Some of you made some really big mistakes. One of the things that I always prayed about for my children was that they wouldn't make a mistake that was so cataclysmic that it would just uh, force the direction of their entire lives. Do your mistakes really matter? Do you have to live with them forever? You know, is it going to be the controlling rudder of your, your entire ship of life from, from now on? Do you have to live with that mistake? Does it really, really matter? And maybe most importantly, does the rest of your life really matter? Or are you just on cruise? Uh, we sang that song in the... Uh, uh, one of the, the lines in one of the songs about, uh, you know, I'm just uh, kind of waiting for glory to come. If I'd have had a mock a lot, I'd have mocked that line out. I didn't like it. Yeah. I'm not, you know, just looking to heaven. There's an old expression that says, sometimes we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. Is the only thing you've got left to look forward to you or, in your life is dying and going to heaven? Is, is, that, is that what's controlling you? I just can't wait till I die and get to those streets of gold. Well, you might live a little longer. You might live another 40 or 50 or 60 or 20 or 10 years. You don't know. I was thinking, uh, as I was preparing this sermon, I, uh, I was thinking about someone that uh, when uh, a couple of weeks ago when we buried Miss Norman, she was 91 years old, and I thought, man, I might make it to 91. That means I got a bunch of years left. I better start thinking about it. You know, instead of thinking, well, you know, I don't know how old this old frame's going to make it. You know, maybe I'm not going to make it much further. You know, does it really, does the rest of your life matter to you? Does it matter to anyone else? 
Is anybody going to care if you die or live? Is the world going to be different because you're still here? What really matters? The goal of life is not wrapped up in the things that could have been. Did you hear what I said? The goal of your life cannot be wrapped up in the things that could have been. There was a a movie that was on TV uh, many years ago, and uh, Pat and I really enjoyed it. It was one of those serial movies, A Lonesome Dove. I mean, you saw that and liked it. It's kind of a cowboy movie, and we kind of enjoyed it. And Pat liked the character Gus. He's kind of a rusty old guy, you know, and cowboy, yeah, the wise old boy. And he had gotten shot in the leg uh, by an arrow by uh, an Indian, and he was uh, dying. It, uh, poison had got into his body, and his uh, buddy, uh, the captain, was uh, with him, and the captain was really distressed, you know, thinking about if he could have, if he'd have been there, you know, he could have stopped it from happening. He, you know, and just going on with this remorse. And there's this big old, uh, you know, rough and tough uh, Texas Ranger, uh, and uh, he was just really depressed. And old Gus was laying in the bed, and he said, you know, you can't go through life thinking about things that might have been, you know. You know, some of you live with that. You, you live with that, and it controls your life. You need to get past that and stop living and thinking about things that might have been. The foundation of this church is right behind me on the wall. Come home, all is forgiven. It's a place where people can start over again. That was my, my motivation for beginning this church. I called it New Beginnings on purpose so that whoever came here would learn and know that they could start over again. It didn't matter whether you come here when you're 90 or you come here when you're nine months or nine days to know that you could start over again. You could come home. Now, home is not your childhood. I remember uh, many years ago, I saw uh, a cartoon. It was kind of one of these character caricature cartoons, and it was kind of a, an old, old, like an old haunted house look to it. Uh, and there was this door, kind of an old, you know, like an old New Orleans door, inner door of the house, and it was, it was opened about halfway. And standing in that doorway were two old people. And they, they looked really small. And there were furniture in the room, and it was all big. The furniture was all bigger than them. And the caption at the bottom says, yes, it's just like I remembered when I was a kid. Never grew up. You know, looking towards that, seeing things through the prism of a child or youth, some kind of way. Let me tell you what, friends. <laughs> I hate to disappoint you. Some of your parents wish this was true. <laughs> but it is, but you can't go home. <laughs> you know? You have to do like the uh, hopes have done. They decided to make sure that wasn't going to happen. They got something so small now, the kids can't come home. <laughs> They'll have to move out for the kids to get in there. You know, there's no way back. And if you got back there, it wouldn't do you any good. It's just, it's just a... a, a a figment of your imagination. If I could just go back to be with mom and dad when I, when I was little, and if I could just redo things, it's not going to happen. You, there, uh, uh, my theology is that life has no reverse gears. There's no backing up. You go to mama's house and you have fun for the day on Mother's Day, or you go see dad on, dad on daddy's day, or you go visit them and take them out to eat dinner, or you, maybe you go on a vacation, but you go home. And you go home with your life, not living in your parents' lives. There's no way back home. Adults, mature people grow up and go on with their life. Home is not the place where you made a horrible mistake. Everyone in the sound of my voice has made a catastrophic mistake. And some of you just can't get over it. And you need to. Will the man and woman who has never made a mistake please stand up? And I need to sit down. We all make mistakes. Some of them are bigger than others. And, 
but you let those mistakes control your life. What really matters? Is home back there going and trying to cor uh, correct some mistake that you made? Then it's not going to happen. You can't do it. You can't make amends. You can't apologize enough. You can't fix Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horses, all the king's men, and you can't fix what you broke. And your life will be richer and fuller if you start realizing what really, really matters. If you had an abortion, you're never going to get over that. You can't fix it. You dropped out of school. You can't go back. If you're working and supporting a family, there, there are rare people who are able to do that and the opportunities present themselves. But you know, you know getting your PhD probably not going to happen. You're not going to be a professor at the University of ABC somewhere. If you had an affair, it happened. If you were involved in adultery, it happened. No remorse, no lamenting, no apologies, no crying out night and day, no punishment to someone is ever going to erase the fact that that happened. You need to go on. You need to leave the ashes of life behind and go forward on the path of life that God has prepared for you. Home, listen to me, this is where home is. And you can go home. Home is Father's will for your life. What does God the Father have planned for you? Did God, God didn't wake up one day and realize that, uh, oh my gosh, look how bad they messed up their lives. He wasn't surprised. You know, if God was going to be concerned about the mistakes that you made in life or the dreams that you never accomplished, he would have just never let you be born. Since he knows, he lives in the eternal now. He just made so sure that you were never born. This series that we're going to talk about, I hope it helps you. I believe if you listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say about these things, it will help you immensely. You will begin that road to a, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. I, I, I love when, when, the, when Jesus uh, said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Something new is here. And he's used all the metaphors. You know, you can't put, you know, wine into old wine skins. You need something new. You must be born again from above. You need to, and a child who is born again begins to walk and grow in, in a new way. Not living in the life that we had with all of its disappointments but living a new way, filled with new dreams, new hopes, new aspirations. That's God's divine plan. And I hope to talk about several things, and I won't be able to go to them and probably the in-depth that maybe we could, but enough to, to bring you there to talk about our marriages, about our finances, about our children, about our time. What's the time that we have left? about the ministry God has called you to, about your knowledge of the kingdom. You know, one of the biggest disappointments to me has been in the kingdom of God is how little the children of God know about the kingdom of God. What's a disgrace? Do not know the principles of the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that. I put this in my notes. I don't know why I put this here, but I, I thought maybe we go, we just talk about your sex life. Maybe you need a sex course in church. I don't know. Maybe your health. 
<laughs> I don't know. Nobody here is that old that it's just precious memories, all right? You know, you know one of the things, I heard somebody say this, and, and it's absolutely true. You know, guys who get to preach at big churches, you know, they don't preach to people they know by and large. They just preach good sermons. You know, and thousands of people show up and hear great sermons. I, small churches like this, I get to preach to people I know. And I know a lot of what's going on in your lives. And that makes it better, because I can sculpt things that really happen. And you might say, well, he's, he's talking to me. Well, you bet I am. Who else would I be talking to? <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I think about you guys when I put these sermons together. I really do. And I'll think, well, somebody said that. So, well, yeah, well, maybe I need to broach that subject. And sometimes I can say things from the pulpit that uh, you couldn't take if I said it to you eyeball to eyeball. So what we're going to do is today we're going to start by where do you go with the rest of your life? And I've entitled the sermon for today. That was just the introduction to the series. Now you know why I only have two points to the sermon. It's how can you change the rest of your life? How can you do it? How can you change? Is, it a, is that just a dream? Or is that a reality that can happen? Let's look at uh, Philippians 1, 10, 11 again and just kind of dissect it for just a moment. For I want you to understand what really matters. The beginning of your trail begins with the uncoming to that understanding of what really matters. Throw away stuff that doesn't matter. If it has no value, throw it out. Some of you run your lives like you, like you keep junk in your house. You can't throw anything away. You need some lessons in that? Talk to the hopes. I'm lynching them twice this morning. They'll show you how to get rid of stuff. They're going to sell it to you so you can bring it home and at their estate sale. You ever see uh, those pictures of the wagon train when people were going west? In the, in the uh, Chisholm Trail, and I went out to Kansas one time and uh, some folks lived there and said, uh, you can still see some of the junk that people just drew along the side of the way. They just couldn't take it with them. They were not going to survive and make it to California eh, with all the junk that they were carrying. I'm telling you, the rest of your life is going to be bogged down in the Chisholm Trail if you don't get rid of some of the stuff that you need to get rid of. And start thinking about what really matters for the rest of your life. So that you may live a pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. I'm going to talk about that in some detail in just a little bit. But I want you to highlight that in your mind. The fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. Christ is doing a work in you. He wants to do a work in you. Why do you hinder the Spirit of God when God wants to do something in your life? By not being willing to, to, to take inventory of who you are and what's going on and what's God's plan for your life. You might say, well, God doesn't have any plans for my life. Well, he didn't, if he didn't have any plans for your life, he'd just kill you. You know, we'll do your funeral. I'm good at funerals. I do your funeral. The fact that you're still here proves to me that God still has a plan for your life. Right. And they begin to search for it. They begin to look for it. And look at the last part of this. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Do you ever think of yourself that way? That your life brings glory and praise to God? Most of you think God's mad at you. Waiting for the other shoe to drop. Waiting for you to do something. He'll finally kick you out. This is not the Baptist church where you get kicked out every time you do something wrong. We're talking about the kingdom of God and God's love and God's care for you. And your life can bring much glory to him and praise to him. Your life should be a living uh, song of praise in the halls of God's uh, throne room. So that loud ticking sound that you hear is the rest of your life moving towards eternity. 
It's clicking away. Tick, tock, tick, tock. That's why I use this, uh, a graphic for the sermon. I put that little clock in there. You would see it. That clock says it's, uh, it's 12 o'clock. Well, it's only 12 o'clock. We still got a.m. We still got some time. There's several things you can do, several options. You can just put your hands over your ears and pretend that the clock's not ticking. And we find lots of ways to, to make sure the clock's not ticking. We'll get a facelift, or we get a tummy tuck, or we get some fancy new clothes or new cars or something just to prove that we're not ticking away. But it is ticking away. The clock is ticking. So your options are to ignore it or make up your mind to do something about it. Hello? Make up your mind to do something about it today, not tomorrow. But today, as you hear this sermon in this place and hear the Spirit of God speak to you that you won't walk out of here the same way you came in, but you'll walk out of here with the resolve, I will do something good about the rest of my life. Your salvation, the indwelling Christ in you, has made you fertile ground for something wonderful to take place. Do you, you know that about yourself? That you are fertile ground? That the Holy Spirit wants to move and, and water and fertilize and grow and produce great things? That's what, that's what he wants to do in your life. And all the ingredients are there. There's a the story and that I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now, but about how God planted a vineyard and in that vineyard, he put the choice vine that it might grow. And he said that he put a wall up around it so that no varmints could get in. And he tilled the soil and he watered it. And he put a watchtower in the middle so he could look all around and make sure that nothing would ever harm that choice vine. And he said that he went and looked at the vine and he expected it to produce good, lush grapes. And he said... It was just worthless little hard ones there on the vines. And God asked a question, and you've got to respond to this question, what more could I have done in my vineyard that it might produce good fruit? And I'm asking you, what more could God do in your life for you to produce good fruit? What more must he do? Is there something that he neglected Or is it maybe you have stunted the growth of the precious fruit that God wanted to grow in your life? Your source of growth is the indwelling Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of a better life. Christ dwelling with you. He's, you know, if you take a balloon and some of you have done this, and fill it up with water. Do you know what that water wants to do? It wants to get out. It'll do everything it can to get out. It wants to get out of there. Because it wasn't designed to live in a balloon. And that's what the Holy Spirit is like that. He's inside of you like a balloon. We need to pop your balloon. So that the Spirit of God can flow out from you. Christ in you, wanting to get out. He's in there pushing his way, prodding his way, trying to find a way to live through you that you might see God's glory in your life and that your dreams would not be dreams of childhood, but that your dreams and your accomplishments might be the very mind of Christ given to you in you, moving out through you to accomplish great things. I don't know what God's plans are for your life, but I know he's got great ones. It may be in a church. It may be in your job. It may be in your family. It may, this, the, 
the kaleidoscope and options that are available to you throughout the entire universe are incalculable. I don't know what it is, but I know that God wants to use you in the kingdom to accomplish his will. And when his will is accomplished, you receive the crown of glory for it by allowing God to move through your life. I've been uh, reading, as you well know, about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, I'm reading a book of his now that, in fact, was the only book he ever wrote and published called The Cost of Discipleship. And he addresses this issue of misunderstanding the message of grace, misunderstanding the completed work of Christ, believing that just because we have this grace and this promise from God that we should take it lightly. He says it's not something that we take lightly. When we take it lightly, it becomes an institution. It becomes a religious uh, whatever it is that it is. But there is no opportunity for, the, for grace to really flourish. Grace flourishes when we take it, when we realize what the price of it is and how valuable it is. You were bought with a price, the scriptures say. You're not your own. You've been purchased by God. Don't you hate it when you get something really nice and somebody doesn't appreciate it? You ever get a new car and some pinhead parts next to you and dings it? And you walk out and you see that? And how does that make you feel? If I get my hands on that person. Well, think about how precious you are in the sight of God. And how much he paid to own you and possess you and to indwell you. And for you to just treat it like open the door and bang it against something. See no value in it. What's the point of getting a new car if you never drive it? Mike Walker was telling me that his dad's got a truck. I don't remember the year of the truck, but he said it was, uh, you know, it's, it's not a big, you know, a half ton truck, but it's a small one. 95. 95. How many miles does it have on it, Mike? 11,000 miles. A 95 <laughs> model car with 11,000 miles on it. Mike, I hope they listen because uh, Mike wants to get the truck, Pop. <laughs> He needs a new truck. <laughs> but I mean, well, he could have been a lot cheaper just to take the bus. Get a bike. You were created for greatness. God wants to do great things to you. He wants to grow through you. The decision to grow in Christ will cause a crescendo of praise to radiate through the heavenly realm. I, you, you want to, you talked about make uh, David dance. You know, I want to dance like David dance. You want to see Jesus dance? Just make up your mind to find out what's worthwhile in your life according to his plan and then be willing to do it. That'll make, that'll get, that'll get folks dancing and singing in the heavenly realm. And not to mention what it'll do to you. So, what we want to do is look at how growth can be initiated through a paradigm shift in the principles that will get that shift going. This is my first point. I'm finally getting to the first point. Are you proud of me? Thank you forever to get there. My goodness. I mean, I have no intentions of finishing the sermon. If I do, it'll surprise me. I've got the rest of my life to do it. There you go. There you go. First thing is, you understand who you are. You need to understand that. Let's look at uh, Philippians 1.6, New Living Translation. And I am certain that God who began the good work, where? Within you. Will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. It'll be finished when, it's, when Christ Jesus returns. And the rest of it is a process. The process of God working in you. There have been many stories told about the ages of what uh, happens when people discover... They finally uncover and understand who they really are. The frog finally figured out he was a prince if he could just get the princess to give him a kiss. 
And she did. And the frog turned into the stately prince. Some of you frogs need a kiss from the Holy Spirit. Begin to see who you are. There's something awesome going on in your life. Toysen finally found out that he wasn't an ape. They had that movie called Greystoke not too long ago. I think it was made back in the, the late 80s. And if you ever get a chance to watch it, they went and got Toysen. He thought he was an ape. And this guy found him in the woods and, and found some books that were were uh, in the area and found his name and he was a, a inheritor of a rich fortune back in England and they brought him back to uh, England and tried to make a gentleman out of him. I won't tell you the rest of the story. You'll have to look at it if you want to see it. But Toysen found out that he wasn't an ape. You're not an ape. You're a creation of God, a wonderful creation of God immensely beautiful in the heavenly realm and God sees you that way. He looks through the prism of his beauty when he sees you and he sees great value within you. Some people interested in the streets of gold, I want you to know that God's interested in you. Amen. That's why he tells us all those things about heaven and what it's like because it's nothing compared to the glory of you in Christ's sight. That the king of glory, we talk about the uh, incarnation when the God became flesh and a baby and, uh, and that little manger. That's not the greatest thing. The greatest thing is when Christ was born again within you. Amen. Think about that for a while. Oh, what a thought. How's about David when he finally realized that he wasn't the run of the litter, that he wasn't the castaway that the brothers didn't like, that he was the one, just a poor shepherd where his brothers were warriors until the man of God came along one day, poured a cruise of oil over his head because God pointed out David and said, David, you will be king over all Israel. As God poured a cruise of oil over your head that you might begin to see yourself differently. Not some battered and bruised and broken life of dreams that never came true, filled in the rust pot of your memories, but of a person who has been selected by God and anointed by God for the work that God has called you for, to give praise and honor through all eternity by what he's done in your life. What about Esther? A slave girl picked up and brought to the king. She didn't have a choice as whether or not she wanted to be in the king's palace. And she was brought in the king's palace to be one of his many wives. And one day because of her, her uncle Mordecai came along and said, told her what was going on. And she said those famous words. I was born for just a time it's this. Have you been born for this time? Are you living now in this year, 2011, for God's divine purpose? Is your only reason for living going to happen this year? Is something so wonderful and so immense and so glorious going to happen through you that God gets glory and you get to be the priest, the recipient and to participate in what God wants to do? Why not now? You're not too old. It's not over yet. Amen. You're not too young. You're not just a babe. Don't let people uh, look at your youth and say, well, what, you know, you haven't arrived yet. You have arrived. Wherever you are, you've arrived at this point that God can use you now. Amen. But what about Peter, who finally came to the realization that he wasn't just a fisherman? You know, I don't know what your occupations are. Some of you deliver things. Some of you work in prisons. Some of you work with computers. Some of you are accountants. Some of you have, you know, different occupations. There's more to you than your occupation. Does your occupation define you, or does Christ Jesus define who you are? One of the things that I always enjoyed when I was working uh, uh, it was nice because I was a computer guy. 
I traveled around the country and installed computer systems for people, and I was known as a computer guy. But you know, after a while, when they got to know me, they knew me differently. They knew me as a man of God. I never had to tell them. I just had to live Christ, let Christ live through me, and people would figure it out. People needed prayer. They'd ask me for, for, to pray for them. People need to get married. They'd ask me to marry them. People need to get baptized. They'd ask me to baptize them. Not in a church, but in my occupation. Let Christ shine through your occupation. You don't have to be in a pulpit to be a man and woman of God. In fact, I've had more opportunities to lead people to the Lord and been more productive in my own sight when I wasn't not in the pulpit than I wasn't when I was. Real change begins on the inside. It's on the inside where it takes place. I like to watch this program, American Idol. Not that I'm a great aficionado of music, but I like to watch young people. I just like to see young people do something. And they got a boy on there this year, and his name is James. He sings songs. He sings music that I wouldn't. You, you don't have money to pay me to go listen to. <clears throat> but he suffers from uh, charrettes. I believe that's the right way to say it. In uh, a mild form of autism. Charrettes. T. T. Rets. All right. Somebody say it right. You, you get the picture. But what he's discovered, what these people have seen in this, is a, is a mus musical greatness. And you can, you can watch him week to week just growing and loving every moment of it. He's so excited about finding out that there's more to him than the kid with the twitches and the, guy, and the kid with all the problems and the kid that nobody really wanted to be around and finding out that everybody wants to be around him when this gift that's within him is exhibited and people love it. People stand up and applaud over and over again. And the judges sit there stunned at the talent that's in this young man. How about you? Are you got twitches? You got stunned brains? Autism, spiritually speaking? Or is there something inside of you crying, begging to be let out? that everyone could see God's glory within you. Yes. Seeing who you are in Christ is the very first beginning of God's plan for your life. You see, the greatness of you is he who dwells within you. And you need to understand that. I've said this to you a hundred different ways trying to get you to understand that one thing about who you are in Christ. And stop thinking of yourself the way you, you have. Your thinking's been so wrong. I've told you before the word repent. We use it in the wrong way because it means to change the way you think. You need to start thinking about yourself differently. Think about yourself the way God sees you. Read the scriptures and put your name in there. When Jesus said, I prayed for you, say, God, Jesus prayed for me and put your name in there. See yourself in the scriptures. See every precious promise of God being to you, not to someone else, but to you. Take it personal. Begin a revelation of thinking that has the mind of Christ that lets you see God's plan for you and the fact that he indwells you and the plan that he has for you. See, residing within you is greatness beyond measure. You know, I, I, and I want to stop right here and say something. This is not some pie in the sky religion. This is not some hoping to swing a uh, low sweet chariot and dance on streets of gold and becoming uh, a great uh, singer or preacher. This is about living your life that God has given you with the knowledge of who's within you and letting it change you. Some of you are living in depression. Some of you are down every day. You can't climb out of the pit you're in. You don't know how it is to have a great life and joy and a sense of expectation of good things. You live with depression and disappointment every day of your life and you can't get out of it. I'm trying to tell you there is a way out for you. God has provided it for you, not for somebody else, but for you. Amen. This is for you. This is a promise of yours. Don't live there any longer. 
Stop it. Today, stop it. Stop thinking that way. Can you hear the voice of God, the Spirit of God crying out to you that God has something special in store for you and that you've quenched the Spirit of God by not believing that? When you, do, when you deny what I'm telling you right now, you doom yourself to a life of regret. You will regret every day. You'll never be able to wake up in the morning and have a day where you don't regret something. You'll always be living under that dark cloud. You'll always be living under someone else's boot. You'll always be living with uh, things that might have been. But if you will grasp this truth, it will change everything. A new panorama of your life will unfold, will unfold. You quench the Holy Spirit when you don't believe this. You won't let him out. You won't let him flow through you. Oh, well, you know, preacher, that's good for you, man. You know, you've been to seminary and you know all this stuff. And you're a man of God. Baloney. There are no promises made for me that aren't made for you. Come on. This is for you. This is God's plan for you. This is not a sermon about beating you up and telling you what a, what a no good you are. I'm trying to tell you how great you really are. Why don't you believe me? Why don't you believe God? Why don't you believe the word of God? Amen. Start believing what it says. You display complete unbelief to the word of God when you deny by your life the things I'm telling you right now. Let me ask you this question. When and what will it take for you to become a believing believer? Is anybody not getting what I'm saying? Would you please raise your hand? Are you paying attention to me, Joanne? Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not over for you, darling. God still uses you. Your testimony is awesome. What a great treasure you have in your physical body. People see you and wonder, what happened to that girl? And you can say, God saved my life when the doctor said my brain was completely destroyed through a massive stroke. You can say, here I am. i tell you differently. I was there. I saw it. Not over, Reggie. Not over, Shannon. Tommy? Not over, buddy. It's the beginning for you, many ways. Spud? It's a new step for you, man. You hadn't been around this very much. You're like a sponge soaking up things. Your mind just twirling around. I say, I never heard this before, Morris. This is new. These two guys are going to get baptized next week. I want you all to come. By the way, if you haven't been baptized by immersion, let's get you baptized next week. It'll do you a lot of good. It's the first big step in your spiritual growth. Bob, we've been walking together as friends for a long time. Still more to come, man. Still more to come. You see it in your own life. Eventually, just a miracle. In fact, she's here. Went out to lunch. <laughs> How great is that? He sat right up here with me and told me he was getting ready for the funeral. And God intervened and he's going out to lunch with his wife. There's so much ahead of you if you'll just but believe the Word of God. Man, I don't know what it's doing for you. It's doing me a lot of good. Second thing I want to talk to you about. Don't worry about the clock. We're not, oh, we're not going to 
lunch until 2.30, so we got plenty of time. <laughs> you discover how to live again. Discovering how to live again. Let's look at uh, Philippians 1, 21 and 22. But for me, but to me, for to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. What kind of mindset is that? Oh, I just can't wait to get to heaven one day. Oh, I want to see grandma and grandpa and mama and daddy. And I want to see all the angels and the apostles. Oh, how wonderful it'll be. Paul can't decide which one's better. Or to live here and do the fruitful work that God has called him to do. Do you ever think about this being just as important as heaven? Right here. Right now. God's will is for you to produce good fruit. That's his will. You know, Jesus cursed the fig tree. One day he was walking by, and Tommy was by your house yesterday, saw them figs your neighbors got, his, you know, I, it's, it's hard not to want to go steal some figs off those fig trees, but we restrained ourselves. Mostly because they weren't ripe. <laughs> Otherwise we would have gotten tasted a couple of them. But he cursed the fig tree because it didn't produce any fruit. And his disciples were really confused about that. And I'm going to tell you some more about it in just a little bit. You were created in Christ Jesus to be fruitful. To have fruit flowing out of your life. Christ in you produces good fruit. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How's your life compared to those things? Don't answer that question, because I'm about to tell you. Let's look at a few things. There's love, and I believe the opposite of that is indifference. Shows itself in self interest. Worried about yourself. Worried about number one, taking care of me. Not caring about the rest of the world. Jesus, who lives in you, the fruit of Christ that lives in you, one of the words that uh, titles that was given to Jesus is that he is the bread of life. You know what the bread of life did? He gave himself for all to partake of. See, real love, the fruit of the spirit of love, is giving your life knowing that you care about someone else. Not just you. What about someone else who needs you? What about a child who needs you? What about an adult that needs you? What about someone uh, on the job who needs you? When I, uh, many years ago, when I was a young Christian, my boss, who was not the nicest guy in town, uh, got sick, hurt his back. He was in bed. And I needed to bring him some uh, material at the end of the day. And, and I, I was on my way home, and I stopped at his house to bring it to him. And we talked business for a little bit. And so I said, uh, can I pray for you? You know, I believe God can heal you. And he said, as gruffly as he could, I don't want your prayers. If I want a prayer, I'll go to church. I said, okay. And I thought to myself, you can't stop me from praying for you. <laughs> you may not hear, but I'm going to pray for you anyway. About a year or so later, I was in my office, and some of you heard this story before, but it, but it bears repeating. I was in my office and, uh, with some other guys, and we were having lunch. And this guy came in, and he uh, really, in a very gruff, unkind way, 
just chastised all of us for sitting around wasting time. Get back to your office and go to work. Well, I just about had enough. I was a lot younger with the Lord than I am now. And I just stood up and told him off. I told him off. I really, really, really told him off. I mean, I just told him what a no good so-and-so that he really was. He deserved it. He needed to hear it. He was so stunned. This is the same guy I wanted to pray for. He was so stunned he walked out of my office and went back to his executive suite. And all my goombas were so happy with me. Yay, Morris. It's about time somebody told that guy off. Somebody gave him what he needed to hear. Nobody else had enough guts to do it. I was a hero. I'm telling you, they, they could have elected me prince for a week or something. I don't know. Everybody left my office, and I was sitting there so proud of myself, getting ready to go back to work. And a friend of mine showed up, uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, he said, uh, you know, that, that wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, and, I said, and I thought, well, yeah, but he, need, he needed it. And the Lord says, well, I want you to go down there and apologize to him. I said, God, you wouldn't make me do that, would you? And uh, you, if you ever try to have one of those conversations with God, you know you're going to lose. So finally, after he put enough heat on me, I said, all right, all right, all right. So I went on down to the guy's office, and uh, I walked in, and he was sitting behind his desk, and I called him by his name, and I said, uh, I want to apologize to you for the way I spoke. I, I really was, I was out of line. I shouldn't have done that. And uh, he looked at me really stunned, and I said, uh, the reason I'm down here, I said, I'm, I'm a, a new believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he spoke to me in my office and told me that I'd done you an injustice. I need to come down here and tell you I was wrong. He didn't know what to do. He said, get out of here. Just get out of here. So I felt really good. I was walking back to my office, and I was shortening the story up because it gets a little long. But uh, God said, now go get the rest of the guys together and tell them the same thing. So I had to go get uh, all my hero worshipers and tell them just what I told them. Uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. They thought I was the nuttiest nut who ever walked on the planet. Why did I tell you that story? Well, because at the right time, at the appropriate moment, several years after that, when this uh, guy who was a, an executive in that company ended up being a president of another company, had a very successful life, lived in a, in a beautiful home in, a, in one of the premier places in uh, New Orleans. His life was such a wreck that me and another guy who knew him well, had the opportunity to go see him and got to lead him to the Lord. And not only did I get to lead him to the Lord, when I had my own company, I went and hired that guy, and he worked for me, and he was with me the day that I was in that boating accident, and I lost my arm. He was there. Shows how God turns things around. See the difference between love and indifference? Caring about somebody? You know why, you know why I had to go through that? Pay attention. You know why I had to go through that? I had to learn how to submit to authority. Because I was a very proud person. Nobody tells me what to do. It's the way I grew up. The kind of guy I was. Made my own way through life. But I had to humble myself. The Lord had to humble me so I could learn what authority was. Some of you hadn't learned to do that yet. You think you're the king of the world. The queen of the universe. You need to learn something about thinking about others and being more important than yourselves. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Let the fruit of the Spirit of God come out of you. He wants to be loving and caring and interested in people. And you quench him by not caring. Fruit of the Spirit is joy. The opposite of that is sorrow. And it manifests itself in your life by never seeing anything good. If you never see anything good, you live through the prism of sorrow. Your life is sorrowful. And you wonder why you can't accomplish anything. You can't accomplish anything living that way. The fruit of the Spirit says that Jesus is the lily of the valley. You know what the lily of the valley does? Brings beauty and fragrance into a place that's desolate. God wants you to bring life and hope and joy to someone else. That you might be the conduit of the joy of God. That you could tell someone else that life can be better. They don't have to live that way. But as long as you're living that way, you won't be any good to anyone else. 
Say, well, I can't help it, Pastor. Yes, you can. Let God's Spirit flow in you. You know, people talk about it all the time. Well, we want some meat of the world. Honey, this is T-bone steak. You you can be different. You can be different as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ residing with you, wanting to come out of you. You can live a different life. You can be finished forever with the attitude of sorrow and indifference. You can have love and joy working in you. It is possible. And I know it's possible because I've been through it myself. Oh, I'm telling you what. It's a much better day to wake up with a good attitude. I'm telling you, life is better. It's kind of like being poor and being rich. I've been both. Trust me, poor ain't no fun. Some of you are still there. It ain't no fun. Now, that guy can't use you. It's a lot better to have money to go to the movies if you want to go or get yourself a decent meal if you want to or go to lunch if you want to or get a decent automobile or a decent house. Those are all better things in a natural standpoint. But in a spiritual standpoint, you are so wealthy and you have so much residing within you. And the, Are you getting the picture of the Spirit of Christ living in you, wanting to manifest himself through you? But he has to get through your time of sorrow and pity party. That's what it is. Well, well, if I, well, I had a better education, if I would have just been prettier, if I'd have just had some muscles. If I just, if I, if I, if, I, if my dreams would have come true, it wouldn't be this way in my life. It's not true. That's a lie from hell. You have the gift of God, the greatest gift ever known in the expanse of all creation, living and dwelling within you, wanting to pour himself out through you, not somebody else, but through you. Some of your kids don't like you because you've never let Christ pour out through you. You tried to preach to them and they ain't listening to your crummy preaching because they're looking at your life. They say, well, if that's what Christianity is, honey, <laughs> thanks, I'm doing all right by myself. You're not doing much better than I am. So your kids won't listen to you. They won't see it. What's that old thing? Uh, I'd rather see a sermon any day than hear one. Some people need to see some sermons in your life. Some love and some joy. Look at mama, she's happy. What happened to her? Look at daddy, he's, he's laughing for a change. Telling jokes. Peace. For the spirit is peace. Not turmoil. Some of you are like living in a war zone. You're worse than Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. All thrown in together. Living in a war zone. Man is a wet hand about everything. Some of you don't know, you couldn't say anything or think anything if you weren't mad about it. Hand grenades. You walk in a room, everybody's got to duck under something. No peace. Now don't get mad at me, but I'm going to tell you, some of you can't sleep because you got no peace. You, you won't let the Prince of Peace, that's the fruit of Christ in you, the Prince of all peace, the source of all peace, wants to move in your life. I ain't going to have no peace until, until I get it right. Well, more importantly, till you get it right. If your husband would only straighten up his act, you could have peace, moms. 
If your wife would only straighten up her act, you guys could have some peace. If somebody could straighten up those kids, I'd have some peace. If I only had more money, I'd have peace. If they treat me better at the store, I'd have peace. If somebody would finally do a decent job, they'd have some peace. If the president of the United States had finally show us his birth certificate, which he did, I'm not disappoint you, I'd have some peace. If they'd finally kill Osama bin Laden, I'd have some peace. And you can't have peace because you're fighting battles or not even your battles are fighting. I'm just debating as to how far I'm going to go to serve. I think I'm going to stop right here. And I'm going to pick it up next week. What's that? I still have two hours. But I don't think you can take two hours of this sermon. You get the picture? Why don't you go home and pray about this? Go read this passage of scripture that uh, we're looking at right here out of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Think about it. That the indwelling Christ in you wants to flow through you. And he can't. If your life is not displaying love and peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, then somebody else has got a control of your life. You know who that is? You. The decision's yours. You say, Pastor, I can't, I can't do this. You're asking more of me than I can do. Well, in the words of the Bible, just go ahead and curse God and die. That's what Job's wife told him in a different application. What I'm telling you is reality. It can happen. The only way it can happen is Christ. You can't do it in your natural, but you can do it in the spiritual. You can learn how to pray and talk to God and ask God to help you, to give you the strength that you need to do these things. And when you do, the Spirit of God will begin to cause these things to grow. You know, Tommy, uh, I was at Tommy's house in France house yesterday. Uh, uh, nothing like feeding a preacher. I went for two bowls of gumbo. And Tommy was showing me his yard, and he's got growing zucchinis and growing all that stuff and tomatoes. And, but the thing that impressed me is over on the fence, he had uh, some, uh, uh, what do you call those, the cement blocks. And he had them turned up on the edge where the hole was pointed up, and he had put some mud in there. And Tommy told me that he was about to just move those things and take the mud out. But all of a sudden, things started growing. And Tommy recognized them. He told me what they were. I can't remember, but he knew what they were. That's kind of like you. Tommy, did you tell those plants to grow? Did you, did you make them grow? Did you do anything to, to cause them things to come out of the ground? A little water. Just a little water. Put them in the right environment. You are the right environment for these things to grow in your life. All you need to do is just water a little bit. And I'm going to tell you some more. I'm getting way ahead of myself with my sermon here. I want to save some of this for later. Is this good? Is it worth a hundred bucks? Worth everything. It's worth everything. Let's all stand. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your precious promises to us that we don't have to continue living the way we've been. 
and we can have a better, richer life because of you dwelling within us. Father, would you help us to understand that? Would you help us to discover living a new way? Would you help us, Lord, that we don't have to live the way we've been, but we can sing with that old song, it is well, it is well with my soul. Would you just minister to each one of us, Holy Spirit, right now, in the quietness of this moment, everyone that's in this room, Lord, I just ask for your Holy Spirit just to minister to us. Lord, start with me. Help me, Lord, to let your fruit of your presence in me come flow forth. Help these moms, these dads, these young folks, Lord, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. Let us be different, not by our own efforts, but by the fruitful choices by planted in your garden, which is us. And let us be fruitful, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name. Amen. And amen.